Hello, 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 guys. Welcome to this new edition of Mind Podcast. And I have our, uh, you know, if United Nations has uh, their five uh, permanent uh, members uh, who can issue veto, I have our four top mind uh, makers, geopolitical foreign policy analysts, and all of whom have a veto. So whenever I come up with an insane theory, all of them have the power to show me any veto saying, Adit, shut up. <laughs> so, but returning champions and uh, dear friends, but, you know, very key observers of um, everything that is happening geopolitically, politically in the world. And uh, together I have uh, um, the editor of Mindmakers, uh, my colleague and uh, someone who's foreign policy analyst. Probably if you guys aren't reading, then get out from under the rock and please read Harita Pusarla uh, Rama Harita Pusarla. I'm so used to looking up your Twitter handle, Harita, ki I myself <laughs> sometimes call you by that. So uh, with that, um, and I also have with me a uh, co-host of uh, the India Rising podcast, uh, columnist and analyst Mohal Joshi and returning champion on Mind Podcast as well. And with him is uh, his fellow co-host of the India Rising podcast, Kishore Narayan, who's, who is and someone who writes um, uh, some fantastic analysis on politics, geopolitics and uh, um, things. So we have uh, two people from United States and two people from uh, Karnataka today uh, uh, joining. So I, I should have said India, but both of them are in Bengaluru. So I started with Karnataka and then and, and Kishore is very happy that I'm not called him to talk about Karnataka. So uh, uh, oh, that's a relief, right, Kishore? For a change, <laughs> yes. So all you Sidramaya fans and DK Shivkumar fans, calm down. Kishore will talk about all of that in a later podcast. This is all about uh, 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 this is all about a major dispute, and no, it's not. Also, the Kaveri water dispute. We will talk with <laughs> Kishore about that later. <laughs> this is about the. The original uh, 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 dispute, the whole Israel-Palestine question, and what has happened in the last week. So, um, before I start the podcast, I would I would urge you guys to do two things. Um, hit pause if you have not read the two pieces that Harita has written on the conflict so far. Um, uh, Kishore and uh, Mohal's fantastic podcast on it. We'll put a link to it. It's it's a great primer on what has happened so far. And this is almost going to be a spiritual sequel to it. We might brush up the similar topics or something. But, you know, we want to talk about what has happened. And also, I managed to interview someone in Israel, Jacqueline Solomon, who, uh, you know, told me some harrowing stories of what she went through and what everything went through. So, yeah. It's a geopolitical pieces that Harita has written, the 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 exp the scope of what has happened and the political ramifications of the podcast is saying and the personal idea angle. We've all in our way talked to people, done it, done podcast and stuff. So here we are going to do a summary of what has happened so far, but also what may happen because there are talks about ground invasions and so forth. Um, before I throw it to the panel, just to recap what has happened on October 7th, Hamas attacked multiple places, uh, forces backed by Hamas, I should say not just Hamas, there were, you know, uh, maybe multiple fighters and stuff who attacked uh, uh, various parts of Israel around the border, more than 1,400 people were dead uh, many people were taken hostage a few of them have been released um, there were some unspeakable uh, brutal uh, crimes that we had heard of I don't want to go into detail but you know I mean, there were just horrendous things that happened to, you know, people in the, in Israel and stuff. And then we had some people on the West actually giving statements and stuff, essentially supporting Hamas, right? So there was a lot of condemnation. Then Israel hit back uh, in the Gaza Strip to take out Hamas. And, and so far, there have been lives lost in the Gaza Strip as well. And there has been pressures on Israel to, you know, issue a ceasefire and stuff. But in the fog of war, there are also some uh, headlines that have gone up and down without any clarification of what is actually happening. Meanwhile, we know that some of the masterminds have been, uh, uh, this is like totally based on press releases that we, you know, we are hearing from Palestine or Israel, uh, have been, you know, uh, uh, killed in strikes. But the leadership of Hamas has not, so they are talking about the uh, ground invasion. So here we are going to talk about the ramifications and everything. First of all, before I throw it upon any, did I miss anything, guys, or did I get anything wrong? If you have to add something, please feel free to add to it before we start to, in the you know nitty gritties of the podcast. No, I think that was a good uh, gist of uh, how things panned out, and obviously we we'll look at the reactions. 
Absolutely. And thank you for giving me my segue. I just wanted to see who, which one of you bites first. So Kishore, since you did, you get the next, you will give it next in line. What do you, what do you, what do you, how do you see this coming? I mean, this is clearly, this is not going to end in like a day or two. This is Obvious. going to go on for a long time. And every side has taken positions, which are, I mean, Joe Biden went there and then the hospital news came out and all the Middle Eastern leaders canceled the meetings. Then turns out the hospital news claims were un, unverified about, you know, IDF attacking, you know, the, now there are rumors about, you know, uh, rocket coming from the other side. We still don't know anything about the casualties. So given the situation like that, and, 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 and you know, just the headlines that XYZ canceled the meeting with an American president. Hmm. I don't think... How would that pan out, right? Uh, every every Middle Eastern country has been taking position. So what do you view from the immediate geopolitical perspective of the Middle East, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, how, how Palestine, how are we going to see it? I think we will see a lot of chaos, at least in the first three, four, five months. Uh, obviously, this has been an emotional issue for both the Jews and the Arabs. So uh, on the street, you will have uh, Arabs uh, protesting almost every day, almost every Friday after their prayers. So you will want uh, some kind of a pressure cooker situation in in places like, say, Jordan, uh, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, so that their leaders uh, will will periodically allow the steam to uh, uh, let out. And I think that way uh, they will they will want to ensure that the chaos does not spread over to their borders. That's one way of looking at it. Another way, obviously, is they would also want to see or be seen to be doing something. So, for example, a, a Jordanian president or an Egyptian president would want to be seen standing for the Palestinian cause. So, obviously, statements like, I refuse to uh, talk with the U.S. president. So, these are other, uh, the, this is another dimension that will keep... Uh, uh, witnessing. And of course, at the same time, you'll also have uh, the Israelis trying to militarily uh, eliminate Hamas. So I think their stated goal has not changed in the past uh, 15, 15 days. So there will be that kind of a movement as well from the other side. Yeah, because because sometimes I find it a little you know strange when these Middle Eastern countries make these brava bravado statements without any meaning, right? And I'm not saying all, but a couple of them have you know made, and we all know who they are. You know, Iran will make something and so forth, right? It reminds me of that old Raju Srivastava joke where he said that Manmohan Singh ne bola ki Daud Ibrahim chode nahi jayenge, and pehle bola pehle pakro to sahi, fir chode ki baat karo, right? So that is the that is the joke. Okay, yeah. you can make these bravado statements that oh, we are not going to spare Israel, but what are you talking about, man? You uh, Saudi Arabia was just about to get into this peace deal with Israel. Now that has been put into cold storage, right? A lot of people said that this was done. Um, the links, the links of uh, Iran with Hamas and Hezbollah and all of them are very well known. Uh, and, and right now they're still being probed. So again, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but the positions that these Middle Eastern leaders are taking, and I'm going to go to Harita first, and then I'll come back to you, Kishore, on this. Um, uh, positions, uh, are they sustainable, Harita? And first of all, um, given the situation right now in Israel, in the wartime cabinet where Bibi essentially has a mandate not just to lead but also to you know eliminate the leadership of Hamas if he does anything short of that because a few weeks ago it seems Bibi was facing massive protests and we never knew that if Israel was going to head into yet another election so how would we look at that yeah uh, first like uh, just want to take it little forward uh, when it comes to narratives kind of a thing because like I just want to make it clear because like after like uh, the attacks, uh, Israel immediately garnered support. And then like the uh, usual suspects have hit back saying that uh, it, is, um, it is the Israel's provocative attacks that has led to all this chaos. Okay, so like as it has been, uh, the, the battle has been raising, Israel has uh, suddenly stuck to a position and then officially the PMO office has released a statement saying that it's not uh, Israel versus Palestine. And they have made it absolutely clear that it is going to be Israel versus Hamas. So it was like uh, kind of like uh, while uh, Hamas was like uh, uh, I mean, throwing a spanner at Israeli works and then saying that Israel is no longer invincible. And then like uh, was trying to do all the kind of a damage that it wanted to. 
uh, Israel has hit back. So that is one aspect which I just want to push forward because like it is no longer going to be an Israel and Pal versus Palestine thing as uh, people would usually uh, put it forward. But it is going to be a Israel versus Hamas conflict. Okay, so that is one thing. Uh, hmm. That's one thing. And another aspect, as you have said, like uh, like uh, uh, the internal or the domestic uh, dissent, which has been brewing up against uh, Netanyahu as he tried to bring in judicial reforms, and then like um, uh, I mean, what do you say? Like even the reservist uh, say to uh, so to say, even the pilots, everybody has. Uh, uh, threatened uh, Netanyahu that they are not going to cooperate with him like um, when he wanted to have those judicial reforms. Uh, this has given in, uh, like, has created a kind of a domestic chaos and fissures within the society. And then that has become one of the added reasons why, why Hamas could have this kind of a lead. So while uh, men, these are, there are several aspects to it. Uh, I just wanted to connect it up to what uh, you were trying to say, Adit. So, like, uh, that is one aspect of it. But what I uh, basically believe is, like, uh, this is, uh, no, uh, men, uh, what do you say? Just like uh, 1973 war, this has also, like, uh, has uh, dented the image of Israel. Like, uh, uh, Israel has uh, initially suffered a setback in Yom Kippur war. And then later on, it has tried to resurrect its image, but then that is of no well. So Arabs have found out that kind of a gap. Uh, mm. that is like, uh, no, and, uh, and everyone was and everyone was talking. Sorry, just just one line, and then you can complete your point. Everyone was talking about you know what happened with the did the Mossad. Uh, you know there was was there an issue because there was an invincibility associated with the Mossad, right? A, an agency that I'm personally you know I've read about, very fond of what. Israel has done to defend itself and everything, but there were questions raised. Exactly. Uh, see, like uh, everybody, like uh, even from our uh, men, uh, in fact, uh, men, as we were youngsters, you uh, men, everybody must have like uh, really adored Israel for its in intelligence agencies, and especially that uh, uh, men. What do you say? Uh, the kind of a surgical strikes, if we can use that term, for like after the uh, Black September events. And yeah. then like how they have eliminated each and every one of them with such a precision. It was like a thing that everybody adored. And then it was a matter of uh, reverence, like um, yeah. so to say, for other intelligence agencies across the world. And it was one of the reasons that, uh, reasons that uh, India really connects with Israel, because like we face similar kind of a uh, cross-border attacks and then we always wonder why our government has failed to do such kind of a thing. So that is one kind of a connect. But then like uh, coming back to like um, uh, this thing, uh, men, it is like a huge setback to Israeli hubris, okay, which they really enjoy. So that is one thing which is going to weigh heavily on uh, Netanyahu's mind. So, like, they are going to go for the kill, and then it is, I mean, as uh, Kishore has rightly pointed, it is going to span for several months altogether. But the geopolitical ramifications, as I see right now, is like, um, see, um, I mean, uh, there are initial reports, like, uh, I mean, I'm not quite sure how it is going to pan out, like, uh, but then uh, yesterday night, Arab League has convened a meeting, and then they have, like, in a way, like uh, slighted saying that uh, Hamas are uh, terrorist uh, groups. I mean, they have hinted in a way saying that like uh, ha Hamas should refrain themselves from terrorist activities. And then it seems like Qatar leader has walked away from there. And also like uh, adding to that, like I just want to say like even like uh, yesterday, uh, uh, one of the crown princes, uh, Saudi crown princess has uh, outrightly pointed that like this is not like uh, how Hamas should have behaved. Because like there is an Islamic injunction uh, against killing of uh, women, children and elderly. So I strongly condemn that, that. And in the same line, he has also condemned Israeli actions. That's a different thing. What I'm trying to say is that there is going to be some kind of like, as we believe, like uh, there's not going to be a kind of a solid uh, consolidation 
saying that it is going to be Muslims versus or like the Arabs versus Israel as such. But I feel that there are going to be some other factors which are going to also add it up. We will see that like some other go- uh, mm-hmm. factors are also going to weigh in. No, we, 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 can, we can conclude and uh, we can uh, say this for sure. And I'm going to go to Mohan next. That whatever be the uh, confusion, lack of confusion on West or East, there is only going to be one world leader that is going to be eternally confused on foreign policy. His name is Justin Trudeau. That guy still does, doesn't know. Like, I thought Justin Trudeau was the Sharad Pawar of uh, uh, geopolitics where he's with every team or he tries to be with every team. But I, that, I don't even think he's Sharad Pawar. I think he's like, uh, he's, he's, he, he's, he's like I.K. Gujral. I don't know which team I'm in, but somehow I'm the prime minister. So that is unfortunately that is that seems to be the uh, thing, and he'll also be very happy that I've compared him to uh, uh, the one Punjabi who took uh, prime minister's office before Manmohan Singh. So, so uh, maybe maybe who knows? I, I'll be getting an invitation from Canada to speak very soon. Um, but no jokes apart, Mohan, what do you think? What is your uh, uh, take on this? <clears throat> I think this is uh, dealt a severe blow to the Abram hackers. They were looking to expand it to include uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel. I think even uh, I think last month uh, in an interview with Fox News, I think MBS was hinting towards normalization of ties, which is now dead in the water. I mean, especially for the short to medium term, because the outrage from the common public will mean that they cannot take any steps forward for uh, for the foreseeable future so this will change the i mean iran iran was uh, not wanting the normalization and they have given proxy support to hamas before so they say that there is i mean there's no concrete evidence of smoking gun per se but there is a lot of hinting towards like possible iranian involvement in it and which wouldn't be surprising because they wanted to derail this rapprochement between all the other Middle Eastern powers, which didn't include them and Qatar. I mean, Qatar also is hosting the head of Hamas. So they also would be not wanting this to happen. And this just just complicates the Middle East situation, especially the Abraham Accords for the, and I mean, an IMAC, the corridor that was just announced with the G20 would be probably dead in the water for now. Interesting. Yeah. The G20, I mean, G20 and that corridor, there is a lot of, uh, you know, questions because it went through the Middle East. It talked about the Middle East um, uh, cooperation. But one thing that we talked about in G20, and Kishore, I want to take this to you now, um, it was post G20. We talked about a realignment of the world, right? You had the quad, you had this, but now we are back to the OG fault line. Right, where countries are coalescing according to, you know, Nith- Bibi made the statement about the clash of civilizations when he met, uh, you know, met the Italian uh, prime minister. And then also you are seeing a change in political sphere as well. So in New Zealand, you had a uh, favorite uh, of the left liberals, Jacinda Ardern, going out and now a, uh, you know, a right of center party comes to power. Mm-hmm. So, uh, th- so things like that. So you are going to have changes in that in New Zealand very uh, clearly, as we know, they, they're a part of the Five, Al- Five Eyes Alliance. They are going to sh- do sharing with, uh, intelligence sharing with uh, America. And I'm sure in this, those alliances and everything has been activated. But the statements to me, and I'm going to come to you for that, of Joe Biden and Rishi Sunak were the most definitive, where US and UK were firmly with Israel. Yes. And and I think uh, uh, France is not too far behind. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron may not have visited uh, uh, Jerusalem just yet, but uh, I don't think his position is any different. But uh, Trudeau, I think, will have to make amends or at least uh, make make sure that uh, uh, he tries to balance it out. Now, in any case, yeah, I, I, I kind of concur with what you're saying, but also uh, wanted to just draw a parallel. Now, uh, when we look at all this, I think we need to ask a question. Why now? And who would benefit from whatever is happening now? And obviously, uh, world was... Uh, moving in one direction, we had uh, UAE, you had Saudi, all of them aligning with Israel. Uh, uh, Saudi had also provided uh, uh, overflying rights to 
uh, El Al, Israel National Airline. So I think that way there was a lot of uh, uh, rapprochement happening uh, on the behest of uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, government. Now I think all that has uh, has come uh, undone, and obviously the question now is who get who gets to benefit out of it. And uh, the obvious the obvious answer or the obvious uh, finger now points at uh, Iran and uh, its uh, proxy uh, proxy groups. So so again uh, uh, the question now is how do how do the other regional powers align? Like for example, say a uh, Turkey, an uh, Egypt. Uh, even say a uh, Qatar, uh, we all know how they have behaved in the in the recent past. So it will not be difficult to uh, to kind of split them into two groups. But but also going forward, what is what is their uh, end game going to look like? What what does Iran want out of all this? Obviously, uh, you talk to any any hardliner from Iran, they would talk about. Uh, the complete annihilation of the of the state of Israel. That's okay. That's one way of looking at it. But then, uh, more realistically, what is the end game uh, that uh, that is say uh, possible out of all this? So I think that's the kind of uh, <coughs> takeaways that every world leader should look at. Uh, but Kishore, it's not just that. US, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm pausing your point for a second, and I want to come. Mohal should come after you. Finish your point, and then. But I want to add to something. It's not that when you talk about you know that land to the you know from land to sea, Palestine will be free, or talk oh, about river, the river destruction the sea, yeah. of yeah, sorry, river to the sea, not land, river to the sea. Um, you know, it's an anti-Semitic slogan, right? You're talking about mm -hmm. the extermination of Israel. You're talking about the killing of Jews, right? So all these bravado, fake bravado positions that they may have taken 50 years ago when there was no social media, that they only took it for their, uh, you know, Friday uh, sermons or, you know, Monday sermons or all that kind of stuff. Um, now, with social media, they are getting replayed everywhere. And so now mm -hmm. you don't want that to percolate that to people that wishing for the death of a complete a community or that country to completely go based on a very misrepresented, distorted and uninformed view of history is OK. And that's what I'm scared that a lot of these leaders who make these anti-Semitic statements or, you know, they, they can have whatever they want to make political positionings. But you don't want regular, hardworking Jewish people who have no beef with you know, people here in US or everywhere go through the same thing that they did in Europe in the 1930s. Sadly, we sadly we find repercussions in all world capitals. Uh, the same kind of protesters get down to the street and they keep uh, uh, shouting uh, threatening slogans. So I think Israel, uh, Jews all over the world, I think even they are in in peril right now. They their lives are also in danger, at least for the for the in, in terms of the near future. And then if I wanted to add more to like uh, Kishore's earlier point, so not only like Iran was trying to derail this, I mean, see, like, if I can quote like Prime Minister Modi, like basically we thought that by with the Abraham Accords, uh, Accord, sorry, uh, that maybe geoeconomics for the first time in a very long time is overcoming the hesitations of history as Prime Minister Modi once said. So we thought like maybe the, pa uh, the Palestine cause would be uh, secondary for many of these Middle Eastern countries, especially Saudi Arabia, UAE and Bahrain. But now what has happened is that uh, unfortunately this uh, historical baggage or whatever you want to call it, issues have come back to the fore. I mean the Palestinians also felt to a certain extent that they were being left out in the cold and uh, this uh, and then like you know they were being like sold down the river uh, in view of the closening or the deepening uh, Saudi Arabia Israel relationship so they all this is also one way for at least the uh, extremists of the hardcore elements of the Palestinian uh, factions including Hamas to assert their importance that hey like you guys can just forget about us because you make a deal with each other we still are relevant in the today's geopolitics and sadly I mean we are again back to the old historical baggage and uh, geoeconomics hasn't, I mean, it does, will work out in the end, I still believe in the long run, but in the short run, we are still kind of a reset point to the old normal. Adit. 
fascinating sorry i was on mute for a second uh, uh, uh harita what is the new normal define it in the terms that you laid out on the piece in your piece uh yeah i'll get back to the piece but then there are two other interesting things that i want to put forward okay one is like uh, about it, uh, iran that we are talking in length but uh, there's another key player which we have missed out that's china okay so i just want to uh, bring china into play because like how it is um, uh, meant uh, actually it is behind this larger game okay uh, be whatever it is like whatever be the reason but uh, the china's reconciliation or mediation has been major step forward and then middle east has witnessed a kind of a mean uh, china diplomatically made a history by like uh, uh, being an anchor to like uh, the rapprochement between uh, uh, iran and saudi that has been one of the major milestones in Mid- middle east because that region is ridden with conflict and then nobody ever thought that they would see such kind of a, a tranquil movement at least a movement that's all uh, but uh, that's never possible in middle east everybody knows that but then uh, with this china has got an advantage uh, men in the sense like it has uh, tried to assert itself that it is going to be a major player in the region and also another thing uh, that we need to look at uh, all these things is like uh, china has got an inherent advantage which us doesn't have is like um, us takes a high moral standing like saying that like uh, it's because of uh, human rights violation this and that like they have like tried to like distance itself from each of these countries and have uh, kind of developed a bad blood with between these countries especially that is seen like uh, in terms of us and uh, saudi when uh, biden has uh, outrightly said that, uh, said that like saudi is going to be a pariah state okay so those are the little nitty gritties which uh, china has like uh, taken uh, opportunistically used it to its advantage so it has not only offered that kind of a uh, uh technical uh, technical expertise or whatever because like like now you can see that like uh, china is helping saudi in becoming a kind of a major ai power in the middle east so these are the small small things that we need to uh, men, uh, factor in when we are uh, going to assess the whole uh, men the uh, when we want to uh, look at the larger picture and another thing as uh, i just want to get back to imec uh, uh, another player which is going to hit by these uh, aspirations that is like when india middle east europe come together and uh, while india would say that it is kind of a reviving of its old spice route uh, uh, china will be at like a, at a disadvantageous position because earlier it claimed that through bra it is going to integrate itself from like uh, it is going to have an like uh, unfettered access to europe okay so uh, um, uh, so the immediate competition for china was bra is imec while people might agree or disagree with it because like uh, still ima imec in talks but then the only player who is going to be disadvantaged is going to be china and another aspect which we need to uh, also like uh, have to um, understand is like uh, uh, if china get uh, if us gets uh, engaged or like it gets busy with like ukraine on one hand and israel on another hand it no longer can have the time to focus on what's happening in indo pacific region so that is one of the reasons why like I mean, not uh, directly but so um, many analysts are pointing out that china might have had a major role in like also complicating so, these issues so and so that- let me uh, let me add something and and come back to you harita i don't know if you guys read the news uh, russia has requested india if we could pay for uh, some of the gasoline in yuan which is the chinese currency so uh, china is trying to play arm twist russia also in that way right so uh, uh, it's <laughs> bill mar had a joke on a show yesterday that it's like china china and russia are acting so close that they have two bands one says f and the other says america on each so that is the situation right now so anyways back to you harita 
uh, that's one aspect of it so china yeah. is one thing which we cannot like uh, miss out and also the chinese statement immediately after uh, the hamas attacks is one point to the whole thing and uh, another uh, thing which i wanted to bring forward is like uh, about the two state solution so now the two state solution is effectively dead and then uh, because like uh, hamas is no longer to, going to accept uh, the uh, palestinian authority so what uh, some of the analysts are like trying to say is it is now going to be a three state solution where israel uh, men uh, according to some reports have said like uh, they have three they have like uh, three three pronged plan which includes the aerial invasion the other one is ground invasion and then the third one is effectively it is not going to have any kind of stakes in gaza strip so that leaves like the entire region having a kind of uh, having a three state uh, solution like that is what like uh, some of the analysts are envisioning so it is going to be like uh, i don't know what we call the gaza strip whether it is going to be a sovereign state or like an autonomous state or uh, we need to come up with a new definition for what uh, we should call the gaza strip effectively because like uh, uh, the de facto rulers are uh, hamas who are designated as terrorists by so many organizations and now after this mm -hmm. whatever mayhem they have created in israel i don't know whether they are going to be like uh, considered as uh, any other uh, uh, no and the, the issue the issue has now become who defines the terms of war right like you you cannot have a conversation that you could have had two fridays ago now after the events of october 7th unfortunately two two weeks it's been two weeks since that happened because how i mean 1400 <clears throat> jews killed in israel if you just do that math in terms of uh, the population ratio it's more than 40000 people killed in america it's more than 100000 people killed in india i mean this is not a small number i mean it, even one death should you know you can't condone it but i'm saying in terms of scale you should understand the scale of uh, you know what is happening so Given the fact that that has happened, the, unfortunately, the sh the con ship for a conversation has sailed to a point where one or someone has to either mediate or some conversation, some, maybe something with the Palestinian Authority has someone from the West Bank has to come out and say that uh, uh, you know we'll you know work with the Israelis to you know make sure that Hamas is not there and then have new terms of engagement. I, I don't know personally. I. I it's just very hard to for me to make given the emotions the way they are charged on both sides uh can kishore you and mohal vein what do you think i mean how can how can there be a middle ground not right now i mean yes you rightly pointed out that uh, the atmosphere is too charged now and even if you even if you start uh, discussing uh, a middle ground uh, the extreme situation or the extreme positions that each each party has taken. I think it will make it, make it untenable for them to uh, relinquish their extreme position and come to a middle ground. So I think not right now, definitely not in this scenario. There should be some kind of a stalemate and only then can, can parties agree to some kind of a middle ground. But yes, uh, uh, just to extrapolate the context that you were pointing out, uh, imagine Imagine our, uh, the 26-11 that happened in Mumbai and then the Uri Pathan court uh, situation that happened and also imagine the situation where the terrorists that, that would have crossed the border uh, then actually kidnapping some Indians and taking them across the border. Imagine all of that happening in one single terror attack across India. I think that's the context that we are missing uh, in India from a security perspective. So uh, that's how big it was for Israel. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is absolutely right in in pointing out the pointing out the enormity of the of the situation that has befallen on them. Uh, right now, uh, Hamas cannot back away from whatever they have started. Uh, Fatah has no no uh, uh, no um, absolutely no stake in all this. I, I just they just have to tow the Hamas line for now. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, has no other option but to continue waging a war against uh, Hamas. 
trying to nuance her telling we are only uh, waging a war against Hamas and not against uh, the Palestinian Palestinians. But uh, I really doubt uh, if that nuance can be held for a long time. So I think uh, with the extreme, extreme position right now, it will be very difficult for a middle ground. Now, in terms of uh, the political settlement, I think uh, three or four or five, all these are untenable in the long run. Even if we, even if there are some kind of a large-hearted deal that happens, I think it may not stand even, say, 15, 20 years. And that is where the problem is. So, uh, yes, it is easy to come up with some kind of a solution, but to implement it on ground and to ensure that peace comes back to Middle East, I think that will be a bigger challenge. When you say when you say implement the solution on ground, that could mean many things, Kishore. <laughs> uh, right now, right now, Netanyahu is arguing that he is exactly planning to implement his solution on the ground, right? The ground exactly. invasion. Yeah. So, uh, Mohan, let's 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 get into the let's get into a very different. We'll come to the ground invasion later, but I'm going to talk uh, shift eastward towards India. Um, first of all. Let me be the prophet of doom here, right? India can be the uh, uh, India. We Indians can have opinion or something, but quite frankly, India has done great. We have given three statements, and now we should just back out of it. Help out your allies if Israel asks for your help or something. You help them out. You know, state your long-stated position on Palestine because you know, pragmatically, we've always said we have you know in favor of the two-state solution. But our relationships with Israel, Israel is our friend, is our ally, have always improved. And this is not our fight, and we should not bite more than we can chew because quite frankly we will we will be squished for no reason right that is my so what do you think geopolitically india should do and i'm not saying you know i i'm not uh, one of those uh, idiots who writes for the wire who thinks that five people on twitter constitute the opinion of the government <coughs> of india so i I'm, I'm telling you in terms of real perspective uh, mohal yeah so i think as you rightly said the statements were uh, very good by the prime minister like first he condemned the terrorist attacks in no uncertain terms and then after the uh, tragic loss of life at the hospital i think uh, he put out uh, statements uh, saying like whoever is responsible should be i mean i'm just paraphrasing it sorry very badly but uh, so the statements were well well balanced and like you know were good so now in terms of the indian angle i don't think like this much india can be involved i mean uh we have reiterated multiple times and it this has been seen through the all the prime ministers like right from Jawaharlal Nehru to prime minister modi that the, we always supported the two-state solution now obviously there will be those twitter trolls or uh let's say some foreign policy analysts i don't want to name them saying like oh prime minister modi is taking a pro israel stand and he's forgetting about the two state solution but i mean as we said on our podcast that if we people just do forget that uh, prime minister uh, modi was one of the first to visit uh, palestine very reiterated in 2018 the two state solution and also in 2015 then uh, former prior president pranab mukherjee also visited uh, i believe ramallah so it was during this government's term that they did want to actively visit, uh, have two such high profile visits to Palestine. So, and, and even if you look at the UN resolutions, I know like some people in India might think that India is completely schizophrenic when it comes to resolutions against Israel and um, Palestine, but like we could vote sometimes against Israel, sometimes with Israel, sometimes abstain against Israel. So we have taken all sort of policy positions on this so it's not that india is like doing a, a full uh, a pro israel position now coming to what are the lessons learned from here i think the which has showed that like i mean israelis were quite proud of that billion dollar fence that they were had with is gaza and they thought they gave them a sense of security but i think that has been came crashing down in one uh fine day where like they just drove a bulldozer through the fence and they just the Hamas fighters poured out of it. So I think this, uh, I know in the today's age of electronic surveillance and cyber warfare, where everybody hypes up these weapons to the nth degree, uh, unfortunately, what in them makes a difference is the uh, boots on the ground. Now, there is no easy substitute for these boots on the ground. Now, electronic and cyber can definitely be a force multiplier, 
but remember for the multiplier you need the base effect right and the base effect is your boots on the ground so while people might uh, want the indian army or the indian armed forces to get the latest drones or the latest uh, electronic surveillance capabilities we still need our boots on the ground another angle that uh, lieutenant general retired like pr shankar brought out was that the agni veer scheme that lot of the israel uh, soldiers were conscripts now they were just served like a few years and there's a lot of rotation or churn which means that some of the talent that or the skills that they learned would quickly be forgot and now israel hasn't been in a long drawn out conflict i mean obviously they had this terrorist attacks so they have not had that experience for a long time so now looking at the indian angle like uh, i think the left hand general pr shankar again he said that by middle of next decade 50% of our main fighting force will be agni so that's something to ponder about that if we have a, such a high churn over in the future we should not be facing that issue where such a high conscript force will will uh, force uh, such if we, uh, we should not be in the such a uh, problem or pickle in there and the last point is like the false sense of security now see like in jammu and kashmir post art, uh, revocation of article 370 Uh, the direct rule from the center has helped uh, calm down the security situation there have been a lot of action against the uh, uh, emical elements uh, in the state who never wanted normalcy but i think we cannot take our uh, eye of the uh, jammu and kashmir i mean things can flare up as seen like in uh, israel the things can flare up suddenly and very because there's a large section of population that is like that doesn't like want uh, indian sent or is not uh, friendly to india so we have to be on our watch out because i mean the terrorists have to at- get succeed one times and level like, the security forces have to succeed like a 100 out of 100 times so uh, many times in the surveillance i mean while it has to be good like also the human intelligence part which was sorely missing has been uh, brought out by uh, this uh, intelligence failure you know and also remember like the uh, election the elections coming in 6 months time in india i mean it's not beyond the realm of possibility that pakistan might try to provoke some mischief by a spectacular terrorist attack it was not like just like the last election we had the tragedy in pulwama where like 50 crpf jawans lost their lives in a vehicle by suicide bombing so we have to be on our eyes i mean even the things that appear normal in kashmir we have to be on our watch out that they might try some new kind of terrorist attacks with some new uh, modus operandi Uh, especially because uh, uh, yesterday mm-hmm. Nawaz Sharif came back to Pakistan. And <laughs> yes, please, please talk a li- and please talk a little bit about that with a DJ lighting also on his back background. Yeah. And uh, so please please talk about that yeah. a little and, bit. And and uh, in in his lengthy speech, he also talked about how he wished for a, a peaceful coexistence with his neighbors. And uh, with just about two three months left for the elections. Uh, i really doubt how the invisible hands in the pakistani establishment would let nawaz sharif actually have have his say in terms of uh, peaceful coexistence with his neighbors so, so kishor i sorry I, I, i yeah sorry kishor i i had to just interrupt you so he meant peaceful coexistence with his eastern neighbor or western neighbor Uh, right now it does not matter both of them are uh, taking a toll on their sorry i just had to interrupt you over there Uh, uh, no, I mean, I mean, uh, their soldiers are running hel- helter skelter even, even in the, even in the Chaman uh, uh, security post, right? So, yeah, that that that's the reason why he said, uh, "I want a peaceful coexistence." But uh, yeah, that was just uh, a rejoinder to your point. Uh, come the elections, I think Indian security establishment will have to be on its toes. Very I mean, on that one. Ah, go on, go on, go on. Are yeah. guys, it's an it's an open. You know that you all have been here. It is a completely open floor. Don't yeah. don't wait for me. <laughs> Jump right in. <laughs> so on the security thing, I think what many have been calling this is actually a bigger intelligence failure than the Yom Kippur war. But see, in the Yom Kippur war, there were some indications. And I mean, sorry, I'll do a uh, what Adi does at the end of the podcast. I'll. plug a netflix series or actually it was just a movie right the angel which uh, where they had uh, the son in law uh, who was the egyptian leader at that time uh, sadat 
Who? No, sir. Sa- Anwar, Anwar Sadat. 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 Anwar Sadat. Yeah, I think his uh, son-in-law was the uh, was passing information to the Israeli intelligence. So there's a Netflix called the Angel. So again, sorry for digressing, but basically they had indications that uh, the 73 war would be launched, but because uh, the war got postponed so many times, they stopped believing the source. So the thing was that this time there was no, I mean, there were some reports that e- Egypt did warn about something big happening in Gaza, but this was l- such a big intelligence failure that they were so focused on the West Bank where there were uh, terrible incidents with uh, like a lot of attacks with the settlers and the Palestinians there that a lot of the forces, I mean, they hollered out the Southern Command, which which serves the border with Gaza, and they moved soldiers over there. So, and with the lack of human intelligence sources, they had, this, this, they're calling it even a worse failure than Yom Kippur was. So, what some people are attributing this, this is like a 9-11, what the 9-11 commission said, that basically it was a failure of uh, imagination, you know, I mean, there were some, some signs, but they completely missed it, uh, like the 9-11 attacks, you know. What, can you repeat the name of the uh, thing you were talking about? Uh, it's called The Angel. It's on Netflix. The Angel, right? Okay. Yeah. So it was, a, uh, I, so I forget like who was the leader at that time. I think it was Sadat. And his son-in-law was a uh, source for the Israeli intelligence. So they got That's him. Like the, yeah. He deflected. They got him to deflect. Yeah. The Ashraf Marwan, that was the yeah, name. Ashraf he Marwan, was, yeah, yeah. It was the I, I have seen that film. I think you only told me to watch it or something. Um, but yeah, fan, fantastic. But uh, but so so what you said is very interesting. So now coming back from India to uh to back to you know this Russia China power angle and stuff, and also uh Harita, you highlighted this in your piece about what is happening in Maldives, right? So India can talk about Israel, Palestine, but it also has to be wary of what is happening in Nepal, uh, Maldives, and so forth. Right? You had that weird situation when Nepali Student Association in Harvard released that statement, which was a pro-Hamas statement. Uh, right after uh, they were a part of the thirty-one organizations, and then they realized seventeen of the hostages were Nepalis. You know, exactly. Who'd... They were killed, and then ten of them were killed. Correct. And so 10 or 7, I, I forget what is, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, I thought it was the other way around. But anyways, mm-hmm. but the point is then, I mean, it's terrible and we feel, you know, horrible for the families, but the students, how ignorant and how dumb can you be that when your countrymen are doing, you are releasing this statement. And so uh, in terms of China, how would India have to look at it? Uh, see, the first thing which I want to uh, mean, come back to is like uh, one aspect again, uh, about like uh, terrorist uh, threats to India. Okay, uh, like we have multi pronged threats from different sides. Okay, so one thing which I just want to uh, uh, mean, point out is like India would uh, from now on would uh, diplomatically focus on terrorism. So global terrorism has uh, meant terrorism has been one of the global agendas of India. And now India will like uh, meant, uh, take it to the highest level. Not that it hasn't taken it uh, as of now, it has taken, but then like what will, what I believe is like positively, if uh, these things are like, uh, meant, uh, what do you say? Like uh, because of this Hamas effect, now, I believe that India is going to garner much more support than what it had earlier. Because like you see, like France, European countries are like um, in, in France, especially you can see the uh, wide protests. Even in UK, you can see like uh, so many protests and then uh, random killings and threats issued to the Jews. So terrorism as such is going to be uh, like uh, the global issue right now. Because uh, in the aftermath of what uh, Hamas has uh, done. Another thing is uh, uh, like what, uh, how it will pan out is like, um, especially when it comes to Maldives, as you said, Maldives is one country where like uh, it has the highest per capita in terms of like number of people who were radicalized and number of people who went to or joined the ISIS forces. So in those terms, India is like certainly placed in a very dangerous um, place because as you see, like uh, terror, uh, men, uh, we have that relentless cross-border attacks from Pakistan as well. 
so now this is going to be one of the key points like the india is going to hit back and then like say that uh, i just hope that like they will have some kind of a global consensus and also like uh, it is a I mean, far stretch thing that i am just envisioning but uh, they will come up with new terms as i have pointed earlier that like what are going to be the kind of conventions or how you have to deal with like uh, uh like a non state actor and what should be the terms and conditions or what are the uh, mean sanctions that can be imposed when it is a conflict between two state actors and then like meaning to say like if it is a conflict between uh, sovereign states and then if it is going to be a conflict between a state actor and a non state actor this i have no, I, 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 but let me ask you this harita and i i'm going to come to you in a second i want kishore to weigh in and then i'll come to you in a second uh, this state non state actors right what is a non state actor is hamas a non state actor because we were told that hamas is in power in gaza but then elections didn't happen so they took power or something but they were also rising in popularity so are they technically they are also state actors right so i'm i'm not discounting your point harita i'm saying who are we dealing with right this whole term non state actor was used as a term by musharraf quite a bit to basically wash his hands off jaish e mohammed and lashkar e toiba and all you know the sayed salahuddin's how to label the sayed salahuddin's and you know your hafiz saids of this world without saying that they are our proxies call them non state actors but they were actually just you know appendages of the state right and to make matters worse you have uh, hamas being added into the terror uh, groups list so i think <clears throat> that way it becomes even more difficult to engage with them in any any uh, relevant in any meaningful manner uh, similar with how uh, you were unable to uh, engage with taliban when they were in power 20 years ago or even now uh, you find it very difficult to engage with them in the within the within the standard uh, books of international law so i think that way yes i mean if you have if you have uh, somebody in maldives uh who wants to give you a tough time if you want somebody if there is somebody in say bangladesh where uh, uh parliamentary elections are about to happen in another 3 4 months uh, and uh, may, may not be smooth sailing for uh, uh for sheikh hasina anymore so i think that way uh, multi pronged attack can happen from any which any which uh, direction uh, the past 10 years may have been uh, quiet from one direction does not mean that that that, that Uh, that uh, country or that uh, the politics of that country uh, may not take a u turn and come back to bite you just uh, i just want to make it uh, like uh, really very easy at this point of time like uh, uh, what i meant to say when it is between uh, state actor and non state actor is like uh, we have what is called as a symmetrical warfare and we have asymmetrical warfare so when we have when we talk of symmetrical warfare where like the real laws uh, apply that is between two sovereign states and then two armed forces but then when we say it is like asymmetrical war, uh, warfare it is between and I mean it can be either between two non state actors that is to say that is like kind of a, uh, I mean states cultivating militias or terrorist outfits to uh, I mean strategically fulfill their like uh, ambitions or ge uh, geopolitical ambitions so that is one way of looking at it like uh, uh, asymmetrical warfare is what we now like uh, rightly attribute to israel and hamas because like uh, it is not a sovereign state so to speak like gaza strip is not a sovereign state and it is not an armed forces it is like uh, I mean, uh, a kind of uh, Uh, militia uh, militia which has like uh, got the backing and support of other players in the region so effectively it is it is an asymmetrical warfare which these mm. uh, people wage on states that is like a guerrilla warfare or like using mm. terror as uh, their weapons they like uh, the wage wars against the, a sovereign state so that uh, is what i meant like uh, men uh, that that like uh, these rules of engagement rules of conflicts have to be redefined and then we uh, we must like now have a new set of rules for all these things uh, sorry by uh, i just wanted to connect it to one more thing because like uh, 
Hamas has issued a statement. Uh, Hamas has written a letter to uh, Guterres saying that like uh, uh, whatever Israel is doing is a war crime. But then in real times, those things don't fall under war crimes because it's not a conflict between two uh, sovereign states. So these are the terms which I just wanted to bring to forth, like what are the implications or like larger implication, uh, uh, repercussions of this like uh, uh, Israel-Hamas conflict and then how everything would change, not only geopolitically, even like uh, when it comes to diplomatically dealing with these forces, those terms would also change. And also when it comes to like organizations like multilateral organizations like UN, they have also have to come up with new terms of engagement and new terms of redefining like how when these kind of conflicts are raised, what is that they have to do. So that is one point which I just wanted to highlight. Absolutely, because, absolutely. Because India is po uh, uh, positioned in a, such a place that India should take up this thing uh, forward because, like, it is going, it is, it has been a victim of terrorism and also of the asymmetrical warfare. So uh, this is what, like, another fallout of this uh, Israel-Hamas conflict should be. This. That's what I just hmm. wanted to highlight. Absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, uh, guys, we probably will have to do a part two of this because I'm moving to the last five, 10 minutes. I mean, I wanted to do an hour and we are already at the hour mark, believe it or not. That's how fast time has gone. Um, Mohal, uh, as I started wrapping up, I wanted a last question and then you can put in your co uh, uh, closing thoughts. Why, do you, why are so many Latin American countries giving anti-Israel statement, right? Is it rooted in some ideology, you know, about, you know, old, something or you know Venezuela said and I don't want to say all Latin American countries but a couple of them did come uh, did come and say that and you know they usually don't take a lot of anti-America positions not all of them at least so what's going on with the have you read something and you know this is just a, a last minute question that I, <laughs> I was thinking about no I mean I haven't read much uh, on it to be honest but mm -hmm. even if you see a lot of the African countries they have uh, taken like sort of a neutral position to kind of anti-Israel position for very few countries. So, I mean, if you like what Prime Minister Modi refers to as the global south, I think they are trying to not wade into this conflict and trying to stay quite neutral. I mean, like so somewhat similar to what India did when the Russia-Ukraine thing brought out that this was not related to them. So they didn't want to anger each side. I mean, there might also be some latent anti-Americanism or anti-Westernism in there that they don't want to take a pro-Western stand. I think they just want to sit this one out as this. I mean, they hardly have any much. I mean, if you, if I'm not wrong, trade ties with uh, both the Middle East and even uh, Israel. So it's like more of a just staying, trying to stay neutral in there rather than taking any uh, anti-Israel position would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as I go to Kishore and Harita, first I'll go to Kishore and then I'll go to Harita and Mohal for your closing comments. Kishore, uh, if you wanted to add anything to what Mohal said about the Latin America question and, you know, your closing comments on this. And guys, we will have a part two. This, you know, there is not something we can do. Uh, 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 the ground invasion question is still there. There are uh, news coming out of Syria right now. I don't want to say what news because, again, in the fog of war, you never know what is news and what is planted. So, uh, Kishore, you first. I think one dimension of uh, the uh, anti-Semitism that we witness in Latin America is all because of uh, the remnants of the Nazi uh, leadership that uh, kind of fled Europe uh, at the end of the Second World War. And uh, historically, they have been uh, anti-Jew, anti-Israel uh, from then on, uh, although not taking overt positions all the while, but subtle, subtle messaging has been going around for for decades now, and that may have manifested now in this in this form, where they may not be outright in uh, condemning Hamas uh, in uh, with respect to the attacks that they uh, perpetuated on Israel. So I think that might be one dimension that I can uh, quickly think of. But in terms of the uh, the overall uh, situation right now, I think the fog of war will continue. The psyops uh, we will continue to see a lot of uh, uh, narrative building happening from both sides. I would definitely want to point out one thing. The Twitter handle of the Israel government 
I think they went on an overdrive immediately after uh, the attack started. Uh, they were, uh, the, first of all, uh, the Hamas, uh, the militants or terrorists or whatever you want to name them, they themselves gave uh, critical and crucial evidence uh, to the world by, by live streaming all the atrocities that they committed. And the Israel Twitter handle, they, they just lapped it up. They, they not only took them, they showed them to the world, clearly telling, do not hesitate to watch this because this is the kind of barbaric acts that they have been perpetrating. And within a span of, say, uh, five, six, seven days, you had uh, people, uh, people kind of literally consuming every tweet coming in from their uh, official government Twitter handle. So I think uh, that way... Uh, narrative building uh, started right from uh, day one, and uh, this is this is the exact uh, same thing that I was also pointing out that uh, governments need to be proactive in terms of uh, telling what is happening with them if they feel that they have been wronged, and at the same time ensure that people around the world uh, stand with them. I mean, we all know how they shared. Uh, 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 the Star of David uh, images with uh, hashtag I stand with Israel, right? So that's the kind of support that they want uh, uh, from people around the world. And that is a lesson for India as well. I mean, for any for any unforeseen incident that may happen in the future, India will also need to build this kind of support. They would want people from around the world to rally with Indians, rally with the government of India of the day. And I think that is the key lesson uh, or that is the key takeaway from all this that has happened until now. But yeah, I mean, uh, going forward, the ground invasion or uh, will will it be a multi multi pronged attack against Israel? I think we can we can uh, we can cross the bridge when we come there. Exactly. Oh wow, what a what a loaded comment. We can cross the bridge when we come there. So <laughs> no 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 puns intended uh, right there. Uh, but um, but literally, you know, we we'll get, cover that in the sequel. Harita, your closing comments before I go to Kish, uh, Mohal and we'll wrap it up after. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what I want to say is like just as uh, Kishor has pointed out, like. Um, Israel has always been a top-notch player when it comes to uh, battle of narratives. So that has been one of the reasons how they have clinched that bar for agreement as well. So it is because like uh, they managed to have that kind of a narrative building back then itself to carve out a special state for themselves. So we, can, we should never underestimate Israelis when it comes to narratives. And second thing which I want to say about this uh, Latin America thing is like, um, yeah, it is true that like uh, some of the remnants of uh, Nazi era have fled to Latin America. And uh, there is also a thing that like uh, Latin America has been a home for several Jews. Okay. And then like uh, there is a... Uh, Men, uh, men, there have been certain studies like uh, Israel has intervened in Latin America on behalf of protection of Jews. So that is one point that like which is also coming out to four now. So uh, these two things. And then like what I want to say is just uh, men, this is one of the act, men, acts terrorist, gruesome terrorist acts which India must like uh, take and then highlight because like uh, see uh, uh, the, the men uh, the barbarity which we have seen in hamas episode is like uh, no less than what uh, it was done by I isis and then we can immediately pick out and say that like uh, isis has completely wiped uh, wiped out like uh, 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 men all those uh, yehudis in um, uh, iraq and then this is the fate uh, that is going to befall on like uh, India or Israel because like uh, it is going to be a kind of an existential threat as uh, just as Israel all, uh, men, uh, comes out and says that it is an existential threat. India has all uh, India must take position right now saying that it is an existential threat for us as well because like Pakistan um, uh, never flinches an eyelid saying that uh, we are going to wage a gachwa against India. 
so we are in similar position and then it is uh, now or never kind of a situation for india as well to take this opportunity forward and then make the world know that india is also positioned in such a kind of a precarious situation and one more thing which i just wanted to bring is like uh, um, in several of the countries have justified hamas uh, violence uh, saying that it is because of uh, israeli attacks that uh, meant this is a consequence of what israelis have done to them but then like uh, mean when it when we want to bring a co- close kind of a uh, this thing to india like uh, this is what they have done to several of our uh, uh, micro minorities like uh, be it kashmiri pandits but then kashmiri pandits haven't justified or like haven't hit back uh, uh with all these kind of a terror acts against uh, like uh, whatever has been done to them so like uh, there cannot be a justification saying that like uh, just because they have done all these kind of uh, things to us or like because of their crackdown they are entitled to this kind of a violence that cannot hold good anywhere and then it is india that now it has men india has to try to bring out these facts as um, eloquently as possible and when we say india we say the government of india hopefully uh, not exactly. rana you been uh, arfa khanam <laughs> sherwani because they have been doing the fog of their own uh, nonsense i don't know since what uh, what the heck have they that i mean i mean i can write essays on their uh, narrative i'm i'm saying it uh, sarcastically but one thing i can see her uh, rana yub's uh, visibility on western media has certainly gone down because uh, hopefully they finally saw what we have been seeing for the last last 5 6 years that this was all a charade of you know try if you are truly a liberal journalist you condemn hamas in no uncertain terms and you question that what was this motivation that why did they do this or something you can't just talk in like you know this grand homilies and stuff like that but uh, you know i'm running out of time so mohal uh, quick last thoughts and you know then we'll wrap up the podcast yeah so i'll dwell on two different aspects of it so one is a military part of it so now because of the sheer scale and the brutality of the attacks there is no uh option for israel but to go into gaza now they have largely avoided going into gaza since 2006 when they withdrew now fighting i mean israel has the latest military technology and hardware but fighting in this narrow gullies or streets it's going to be hard like i mean if you bring in tanks which is like kind of impossible still you could be hit with rpgs or hit with anti tank missiles so it's going to be like a nightmare for any military even like the wanted uh, uh israeli military i mean there's going to be a lot of blood bath and casualties unfortunately now another thing is the uh, presence of 200 hostages now they did release two of them uh, just yesterday but they're going to be used as human shields by hamas now uh, even a prisoner action is going to be tough because if you remember like uh, gilad shalit an idea soldier who was kidnapped in 2006 he was exchanged for like one israeli soldier was exchanged for 1000 palestinian prisoners so i'm the 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 hamas is going to extract their pound of flesh for trying to uh, get this i don't think maybe the foreign hostages might be released but these israeli citizens will not be released just uh, simply so it's it also complicates like the israeli military like how do no, they no, it, it was to it was to do that because then suddenly now you have america saying oh let's wait for all of them to come don't do that gives a chance for hamas to fortify and stuff like that i yeah, i mean yeah. when i don't know the semantics of this but uh, apart from this you cannot draw any other conclusions on that yeah. and and you know and and both sides are right i mean you obviously want all the hostages to come back safely you don't want any more casualties but then mm-hmm. you also don't want to create a situation where you're dropping the ball Yeah I mean and the element of surprise has now been lost so Hamas is well fortified for any potential israeli attack and the other point I wanted to touch on was the political solution so I think I mean we could have this never ending cycle of violence by like Palestine Israel Palestine Israel so uh, what there has to be a political solution now, obviously the environment right now today is not good I mean for any kind of political solution but this also has become tricky because if you remember like and uh, benjamin netanyahu with his present government he has like members of the uh, hard right now by expanding the settlements into west bank i mean which has all, always been a constant source of friction with the palestinians and also bb 
try to push for a de facto one state solution and also try to weaken the Palestinian authority by giving implicit support to the Hamas. Uh, but it spectacularly backfired on him. So even let's say in the future, if let's say things calm down, which doesn't look at all in today's day and situation, how are they going to even negotiate a political solution? Because you have a complete splintering of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and you have Hamas in Gaza. So it's going to be like next to impossible. Even if negotiations could be held successfully, how are they going to come with a solution? So unfortunately, we might be stuck with a never ending cycle of violence, but we can always hope for the best, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I, I hope I hope what our analysts, uh, my friends have said, you know, they're a they're a it's a very bleak picture, but it's also something that could happen. I hope we are all wrong. The world returns back to normal in a week and we are all getting together to do a, 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 a sequel podcast where like Kamal Air, and we didn't even know or maybe talking about the Cricket World Cup but unfortunately we do not live in our make-believe world there are real world solutions real world problems and uh, you know we are here to you know talk about them discuss them and just hope that you know people find some peace in this tough moment because neither is it easy for uh, citizens of israel nor is it easy for citizens of gaza they are all facing a very um, very tough time and uh, one hopes for you know peace and then hopes that some solution comes out of this far with that i'm going to end this uh, edition of mind podcast uh, mohal kishor harita thank you so much for coming this has been a fabulous fabulous discussion uh maybe we'll do a sequel of this uh, uh soon hopefully and uh, th- that will be a final no more wars uh, <laughs> after that we have a lot of old wars that we can get together and uh, discuss as my mom would say the chandal chokri should get back together again <laughs> and talk about all the wars. uh but uh, but thank you all and uh, um, thank you guys for joining please like share subscribe follow them on social media you can see their handles we'll also tag them um and uh, you know keep supporting india rising podcast keep reading mind makers guys together we can make the change thank you